as an artist or a new artist, how do I approach if I'm going to go inside? Because there's different elements that you can approach a, a deal. You can stay independent, mm -hmm. right? You can go through a distribution company or you can, you know, go into a traditional major. It depends on what's the best model for you. If you're trying to go into a label, you need to have some traction and momentum or you sit exactly where you are. You're just a high risk opportunity. But it wasn't like that in the 90s though. Because there wasn't no following like that back then, was it? So in the in the 90s, but that's the contractual piece is what you're talking about, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it was a different, it was a different dynamic because people created artists, the gatekeepers, the gatekeepers were really controlled by the labels, meaning what are the gatekeepers? Touring, television, radio, publicity. In order for you to become a star, quote unquote, you had to go through the traditional record business. Mm -hmm. Right now, artists can become a star in their right. Mm -hmm. right. You may not be a big national star, but you can feed yourself. You can you can provide for yourself. You can you can monetize yourself. You can do all of the things to be in the business of music not necessarily a star. And if you're doing a good enough job at that, someone will come find you and then offer you, you know, the, the bigger deal or want to buy into your business because now it's proven, mm. right? You've stepped in the business and you've created momentum yourself. And now the risk of it, believing just because you fly, you can rap, whatever it is, or you can sing, you just got out of the church, you don't want to do gospel no more, mm. whatever those things might be, you know what, that risk is gone because you have created that. Welcome to another edition of the Social Proof Podcast, where we find dope people that do really, really dope stuff. And this guest today has been doing dope stuff for years. You are like decades. Like you are responsible for, um, for the soundtracks of people's lives. Mm. Maybe not all, but you've touched something that affected somebody that's listening to that. We got Benny Pugh here, guys. Round of applause. Benny Pugh. Yep. All right, so Benny, um, I was I, like I was telling you earlier, I was talking to my boy DJ Efeezy. We went to school together. That's my boy. Shout out to Efeezy. Uh, that's my guy. <laughs> and I was when your uh, I don't know if it's your publicist or reached out mm -hmm. was telling me about the book. I was like, well, I don't know a whole lot about the music industry, so let me call somebody who does. So I called E and I dropped your name, mm -hmm. and he said, "Yo, he's a gatekeeper. Oh, like he's an OG. Like he." Uh -huh. He's one of those people like you really, really have to get approval for from. And I was like, yo, this is interesting. For somebody like him who has been in the business for a long time to big you up like that, I'm like, yo, I got to meet this guy, man. So how do you introduce yourself, Benny? So I start with Benny Pugh. And there's, there's a reason why my name is branded as Benny and Pugh. I mean, I'm a storyteller, so I'm not going to take up too much of your time. Bro, I need so, all them stories. Okay, so my sister and I, we grew up in um, White Plains, New York. And what's the chances um, living in our five-family house, we lived in the attic. And in the winters, it was really cold. And the summers were really hot. You said you lived in the attic. Yeah, yeah. That's where the apartment we grew up in was on the fifth floor of a five-family house. So we oh. were in an attic apartment. Oh, so somebody and owned this five-bed, this five-unit, five, five, unit, unit five house, family home. And you lived in, in the, the attic. attic. Right. And as this, you know, think about what the attic is, is where the roof line is pitched. So obviously, you know, um, I think the ceilings might have been just barely six feet. But in any event, so um, my sister and I, uh, Regina, what would be the chances that in this house, there were skunks that lived nearby, mm. right? In proximity of the house, sometimes under the house, sometimes in the woods. So when mm. a cat or a dog or anything that would instigate or aggravate it, it would fumigate, right? It would for the perfume out. Obviously, we know what skunk smells. So it would come through the house and actually ascend up into the attic. So we literally would go to school smelling like skunk. Mm. So with the last name of Pew, smelling like skunk, you could imagine uh, what kind of ridicule oh, they was children. You. They killed us regularly. So at that point, um, I took a negative and decided, like, you know, I'm going to make my name matter. And that's why I introduced myself as Benny Pugh, because I said, you know what? I can't change my name. At that point, I couldn't change my circumstance. So you know what I'm going to do? Make a difference. Mm. So that's why 
I introduce myself wow. as Benny Pew, not Benny, not Ben, not any abbreviation thereof. Benny because Pugh. I see where I'm going and what I'm going to become. And you, you just embrace that. Of course. Hard to embrace it as a kid, though. Man, listen, you just become a fighter. Yeah. You know, my two-piece game ain't bad either. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I can handle myself. <laughs> yeah. For sure. So as you, like, obviously, we understand your, I guess kind of just tell us some of the, um, uh, some of the, the accomplishments that you've had in the music industry so far. So I started my business. I started in the business at Motown Records, and actually, I fell into the music business. It wasn't uh, my aspirations uh, after graduating from college. I went to St. John's University in Queens. Uh, during that uh, my time as a student, I also did stand up comedy for four years. So I was one of the really? original founders of the Uptown Comedy Club, which was this, this club in in uh, New York City. Was hot back in the nineties, right? You say you found you were one of the one, founders, one of the original. Um, founding members of the Up, Uptown Comedy Club. So people who came out of there, J.B. Smoove, Bill Bellamy, um, Dougie Doug, like everybody ran through. That was the premier oh, wow. uh, comedy club um, in Manhattan and hence became, you know, the blueprint for a lot of the shows that came after Def Comedy uh, Jam mm -hmm. being one of the biggest iconic comedy shows, right, in, in culture. But, you know, the, the whole concept started with just some local comedians performing and a DJ playing between, right? Because, mm -hmm. you know, normally between comics, you just sit. Yeah. And somebody was like, yo, we gonna rock. And that's what happened. You know? Oh, that's dope. Yo, it's crazy, right? That's dope. And um, so I got booked for the show um, at The Cellar, which was located in 96 in Amsterdam, in Harlem. And at the end of the show, I just grabbed, um, I was asked, what was I doing? And I didn't even make any plans on what I was going to do uh, in, in regards to my next step in life. And the promoter at Motown asked me, well, why don't you be my intern? And from where Hold on, you do your set, and then a guy just randomly asked you. Yo, like, at the end of this, after this interview, you go, yo, Benny, what you doing? Right. You want to buy my podcast? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> right? Similar like that, yeah. Right. So she asked me, what are you doing? And I didn't even prepare my, I literally just graduated, hadn't prepared my resume. She was like, why don't you come and be my intern? Her... It's so funny and ironic being here in, in Georgia. Her intern was going back to Clark University. Mm -hmm. And she asked me if uh, I wanted to be the intern. And that was the first time she ever seen you? First time. And what's so crazy about it, I didn't even know what an intern was. You know, next steps weren't really part of our conversation. You know, kids now, we, we, we uh, educate them on the, our shortcomings so that they never have to go through that. I had no idea. But my background was sales. So I said, naturally, what a salesman would do, say, yeah, I can do that. I'll be, I'll be your intern. So I went down to Motown Records, and needless to say, uh, with a sales background, I showed up as a salesman, three-PC suit, anti-shake case, you know, wingtips. How old Everybody were you? Everybody looked at me like I was crazy. 21. How, 21 years old. 21 looking nuts. <laughs> <laughs> because you got to think about it. Record companies back then, and even currently now, were more equivalent to what a tech company is today. Style, fashion, you know, cool. So I was so uncool showing up um, how I did. And that's how I uh, got my first step into the music business. So when you got there at Motown, uh, what, what did they tell you you'd be doing? I was the intern. So I was working in the uh, promotions department. Mm -hmm. And during that time, uh, she had asked me um, to correlate her expenses, do her T&E. I had no idea, once again, travel and expenses. Gotcha. So when you work at a corporation, all of your expenditures you have to keep in order for the company to reimburse you gotcha. for. So she would give me these receipts and she would also give me a, um, a check to reference the expenses with. You know, it was crazy um, at those times because like then I was typing 90 words a minute, uh, 60 words a minute from home row. And it were very few men that actually were able to do that or did that That's unless she was fact. like ex-military or yeah. something crazy in that degree. So what year is this? This was in the 90s. Gotcha. Yeah, so now, I ain't gonna let you date me, bro. <laughs> you say, you know, I, see, I see you one of them indefinite viewers. Like, you trying to get it all? Nah. So it was crazy. So she, um, during the process, she says to me, um, you know, I need you to take care of this for me. And one day I said to her, I don't feel comfortable like seeing your, your check, you know, your payroll check. Mm -hmm. And she was like, what do you mean? I said, you know, this the check that you give me, you know, I don't 
and I'm just not cool with that. She's like, no, baby, that's that's uh my T and E check. I was like, what do you mean? Because I didn't know what T and E was mm. either. She said, okay. You know those dinners we go to? The company pays for that. My cable bill, the company pays for that. My car note, the company pays for that. Mm. My gas, the company pays for that. Cable, company pays for that. I was like, really? Oh, that's what I want to do. Uh... And that's when I fell in love with the business of music. And I got an opportunity um, to fall in love with the music business as a whole. Being introduced to like Boys and Men Day One. Um, taking them on the road, Shawnee Wilson. You, you know, took those, them on the road. Hold on, absolutely. Boys the Men. Oh yeah, yeah. You took them. Oh, you say you took them on the road. What do you mean? College, college show. You know, like artists come to. Yeah, yeah that's what we did. What we was did they like? like? See, I'm getting yo, a year now. Amazing. I'm getting a year now, baby. Yo, I'm in here. You know what? <laughs> yo, they were some of the best, disciplined, humble, eager artists that uh that I'd ever met at that time. Like, you know, like you know, kids that are just raised right. They were just raised right. And people who really deserve what they get, they were the ones that put that energy forward. They were amazing, amazing individuals. No reason. And their ethic, their work ethic was bar none. All of them. All four. All of them. I, we see their talent, right? Mm -hmm. And we hear the stories. I'm actually from Willingboro, New Jersey, like South Jersey. Mm -hmm. So I, I know where that is. Yeah, right next to that. Philly. So we hear about kind of, you know, they were singing on the street corner and things of that mm -hmm. nature. Is that some of the stuff that you witnessed? No, they were already signed to the label. Gotcha. Michael Bivens was the one who signed them to the label. They gotcha. were through his venture, yeah. And what, what, like, give me a scenario of something that you saw that, that, if you can remember, like, being impressed by that, like, yo, this is, these, these dudes is different. I mean, man, their vocal ability was insane. Yeah. I mean, four part harmony, I mean, it's just insane. Like, you know, these are, you have to think about the level of performance that they gave is, you would imagine, um, novice or new artist was at, you know, a very commercial, brilliant level. And they were just kids, right? You would see their level of performance on television, right? It would be super produced, but they were just raw talent, just giving it. So it was, it was amazing wow. just to see that as an introduction to what talent was and then start from day one, become global superstars. Yeah. Right, because they really artists do start from nowhere. Right, 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 right. Right, everybody starts from somewhere. Yeah, and then you go, you know, where your journey takes you. Got you. So, like, you were there, kind of boys and men were like just getting signed, or they just got, or they they were signed mm -hmm. already. Were you a part of Cooley Eye Harmony or? Mm -hmm. Wow, Yo, that just in the promotion amazing, aspect. Bro. I was in the college department then. And gotcha. like, so you got to go take them yeah, to the colleges. Move around. Did they ever get any boo? Did they get booed at all ever? I don't remember that. No? Nah. Nah, they weren't a booing group. You know, if you think about it as a performer, you know, each show is different. You might not, yeah. like, doing stand-up, you know, there's times you rock, yeah. right? And everybody, <laughs> ah! yeah. right? And then there's, like, mm -hmm. <laughs> right. just depends. Got you. Right? So, so when you start, when do you, like, level up where you're not just... The promotion boy. So I leave. So I leave Motown and I go to work for Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis as their national director of um, street team marketing. And what label was that? That was Perspective Records. Perspective. So the big artist there then was uh, Sounds of Blackness. Okay. okay. Right. Mint Condition. Yeah. Those yep, were. Yep. You know. So I did the uh, promotions uh, for them. I left there. When you say do promotions, radio like, promotions. Even that is it. I'm going to the radio to negotiate a deal with them or so what you do is you're representing the artists um to the radio stations to give them an opportunity to be heard gotcha so you have to think about the radio aspect of there are there are hundreds of um records that potentially come across a, a program director's desk so you are now vying for three, four, five slots that they actually rotate records out every week. Got it. So ultimately you go and you give your pitch on why your product should be played. And that was you? Yes. That's With your sales mission. background. So you got to literally yes. convince them, of yo, course. people are going to love yeah. this. Yeah. So. Your favorite, the favorite record that you hear isn't favorite because somebody loves it. Somebody's on the back end making sure that you're being heard and that you're your product is actually being represented and uh, 
in, in front of the people that can make the difference in gotcha. putting it on. So that was a step up from street promotions? Well, right after you left? They're different. Right. So from that position, uh, Motown being a regional director of promotions, dealing with the region mm -hmm. in the marketplace, and then being a national street promoter, which is equivalent to influencers today. You have yeah. to think about what the street team guys were. They yeah. were the hot people in the marketplace. So I managed that aspect of the business. Then I went from there to uh, Arista Record and moved to Washington, D.C., where I was another regional director for their particular label. Gotcha. And we had a lot of great artists that came through there. Monica, Usher, um, Goody Mob. Um, we also had all of the Rowdy stuff, all of the LaFace stuff, and the Arista yeah. Proper stuff. Man. Um, so it was, you know, it was a great time then. My big shot is when I moved back to New York from D.C. was at MCA Records, where I ultimately became the senior vice president, moved west, and that's when I had the opportunity to work with Casey and JoJo, you know, the All My Life record, Shaggy, It Wasn't Me, Shantae's wow. Got a Man, um, signed Feel Mob, which, you know, was, was the first artist that I actually that's had an it. opportunity to say, you know what, I believe in your talent, want to bring you to the label. Hold on, back, back up a little bit. Mm -hmm. So this is like like the golden era of hip hop, R and B, just music. Mm -hmm. Period. Um, like, give me some like starstruck or like wow moments that you can remember that you'll never forget from like some some of these your you know your favorite artists. Like, cause I know you got like stories of being on the road or mm -hmm. just like seeing what's happening behind the scenes. So, so we're gonna be careful with that, right? So I'm, yeah. gonna, I'm gonna find something that I, that's entertaining, okay. um, I, or or rightfully so, something that I I just never, you know, I was blown away about. It's just the work ethic of a, a lot of the superstar artists. I would say when you look at Mariah, you look at Lionel Richie, you look at Jay, you look at Future, you know, you look at Rihanna, um, you look at Young Jeezy, you look at Rick Ross, you look at the dynamic of all of these people, what they share is driving determination and motivation. Mm -hmm. And they, they're all where they are is because they see where they're going. Mm -hmm. And that is probably um, more profound than, you know, just a giggle or two. It's just working with people and seeing people and they, it's in their eyes mm -hmm. on how they know exactly where they're going. But we were actually here in Atlanta once with uh, Lionel Richie. This is when we had him at Def Jam. And Lionel Richie, you know, hello, Jesus is love. Like, just, you know, every, like, amazing. He is so humble. Um, we were at the uh, old St. Regis Hotel. And Lionel just felt one moment that he was going to jump on the piano and just start playing. And everybody assembled around, like, you know, that show might be hundreds of thousands yeah, of dollars, yeah. right? But like, yo, dude was just so cool and just about the fans and regular that it, you know, was like, wow. So superstars are really real people, right? Yeah. Like they are really real people with no hangups and and just enjoy having fun just like the rest of us. So that was amazing. In the one thing I know just outside looking in mm -hmm. from the music industry, it just seems like there were a lot of bad deals going on back in the day. And I don't understand it because, mm -hmm. again, I never was in that space like that. What was the music business like back then? So it's two ways of looking at it, right? The bad, the bad are, ha, have there been bad deals? Yes. But there are bad deals in every aspect of life. Yeah. You know, people stopped talking about it in the 80s and 90s. Your parents were getting um, loans from the bank for 21% on a mortgage. Yeah. That's a bad deal, That's right? Bad but they deal. got a house. And you grow up in that house, right? Because you only know what you know. And if you don't know better, you can't do better. So ultimately, people who are in those circumstances and situations, you have to ask them why they decided to take those deals, mm -hmm. right? Because there's always an alternative. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, if it worked for you, if that's what you felt was the best entry point for you, mm -hmm. then now you have to live with the consequences. But that doesn't mean that, you know, we're going to give the people a pass who administer those knowing better, taking advantage of those who don't know better. Yeah. You no, know, that has to be dealt with as well. So there are people who have, on the other side, amazing deals. Listen, if I was going to teach you how to make a million dollars, would you give me 10000 Like if I had a course teach you how to make a million dollars and you're positive, you're going to make a million dollars, would you give me 10000 Of course you would. It's no-brainer, right? So in a calendar year, 
we make seven figures with the podcast. But there's 21 things that I extracted from that that you're going to need to launch a podcast. But I only got time to give you three right now. One is you need a distribution platform. The distribution platform is what you upload your podcast to. That platform sends it to Spotify, Apple, Google Play, so that your supporters can actually listen to your podcast. You're also going to need a microphone. You need a really good microphone so it's crispy audio. And three, you need an income strategy. This is not necessarily a hobby, unless you're going to make it a hobby. But I can teach you how I made the seven figures with these 21 things. Now, the good news is you don't have to give me 10,000. My ebook is only 37 bucks. Okay? So listen, go to podcastebook.com and get the 21 things that you need. And I, I can explain it in detail, all the things that you need. Okay? Podcastebook.com. Let's get to the episode. All right. right. So, so in those, I mean, we don't, we don't get to hear about that. Like I had a conversation with um, an artist. Uh, and he was saying like he's stuck in a deal till he's 60 or something like that. Mm -hmm. And he'll never be able to get his master back until a certain date or, and it's like one of the biggest stars in the world at this mm -hmm. time. And I'm, I, I'm trying to understand where I'm kind of on the side of the label, right? So let's say for instance, that, um, I have, you know, I've, I've got money and I'm signing an artist. I'm mm -hmm. signing you. You don't have any money. You just have an amazing talent, mm -hmm. right? I'm taking my money to invest in you, the talent. Mm -hmm. And it just so happens that with my investing the money in you and you promoting and doing what you do, well, I promote you, you become a superstar. And now you're, you're a superstar, but you're not making as much money as most people think a superstar should make because we're in this deal where I who invested and created this, I need my return because otherwise I could have put all this money into you and you do nothing and then I'll get my money back. Mm -hmm. So I love to hear your perspective on that, on like, I'm taking a chance on you with my money. If it works out, it works out great and it's beneficial for me because that's why I put my money up like that. But if it don't, I lose my money. I mean, you're 100% correct. So how so the real question becomes is as an artist or a new artist, how do I approach if I'm going to go inside? Because there's different elements that you can approach a, a deal. You can stay independent, mm -hmm. right? You can go through a distribution company, or you can, you know, go into a traditional major. It depends on what's the best model for you. If you're trying to go into a label, you need to have some traction and momentum, or you sit exactly where you are. You're just a high risk opportunity. But it wasn't like that in the '90s, though. Because there wasn't no following like that back then, was it? So in the in the 90s, but that's the contractual piece is what you're talking about, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it was a different it was a different dynamic because people created artists. The gatekeepers, the gatekeepers were really controlled by the labels. Meaning, what are the gatekeepers? Touring, television, radio, publicity. In order for you to become a star, quote unquote, you had to go through the traditional record business. Mm -hmm. Right now, artists can become a star in their right. Mm -hmm. right. You may not be a big national star, but you can feed yourself. You can you can provide for yourself. You can you can monetize yourself. You can do all of the things to be in the business of music, not necessarily a star. And if you're doing a good enough job at that, someone will come find you and then offer you, you know, the, the bigger deal or want to buy into your business because now it's proven. Mm. Right, you've stepped in the business and you've created momentum yourself, and now the risk of it, believing just because you fly, you can rap, whatever it is, or you can sing, you just got out of the church, you don't want to do gospel no more, mm. whatever those things might be, you know what that risk is gone because you have created that. Got you. Yeah, so that's yeah. a different deal that you're going to walk into for sure. And you're probably not going to answer this, but I'm going to ask it anyway. So, with boys to men, one person left. Why did he leave? I was going in. I don't know. I mean, you know, you know, I being in the know, game. I don't, I don't, I don't know. He you know he's. I haven't stayed up with him. Okay, all right, yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah. So you, 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 do you say you fat, you signed Future? Oh uh, yeah, you, yeah. You signed Future to Epic. To Epic. So when I was at what Epic, year was this? Uh, that was 2012. 20, 2012. 20, 2011, 2012. First time you saw Future, what's going through your head, or what's going on? Oh, he was a star. Like when he when he when he came to the office and we met, like you can just tell, like he was he's a deep brother. He's a funny brother. 
He's a creative brother. He's a talented brother. He's very in tune to his artistry, his gift, and his music. And so it it doesn't take a lot to figure that out. Actually, the, um, uh, there was someone who brought me the music. I normally traditionally what I would do. I have my own means of finding talent. And uh, when I'd heard his music, I'd call down to Atlanta and ask some people to, you know, get me some music, find out who this guy is, et cetera, et cetera. And then really, you know, drove it, dove into the and where to were the you at this hole, point? New York. You were in New York, and you just heard about Epic. Future. Epic. Uh huh. Did he have an album out or a song out already? Well, he or yeah, he did. Okay, got you. Okay. Mm-hmm. And um, it was really interesting um, at that point. It was early Tony Montana. Mm-hmm. So it was, um, and you got it, right? And you got to think about New Yorkers are snobbish to Southern music, you know? And uh, me as being a New Yorker, I've never signed anybody from the Northeast. I'm in really? Southern, never. I just told you, Feel Mob was my first artist. Mm-hmm that I brought because it's, you know, it's uh, it's just a different energy. Not that I'm biased against New York, but I had like a real connection, you know, with the Southern sound and and really could identify and hear what was next. You know, um, Cash Out was one of the ones that, that I brought also. Another, you know. Really what song was that? Cashing Out. Yeah, Cash Out. I mean, but sing the... the t- oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, got you, got you. Did he do something else after that? When you say do something, I mean not do. I mean, did he have another hit song or? He had a career. He had a career. Yeah. <laughs> I know. He's he's dancing on the line. <laughs> I, I feel you. I feel you. Field mob. Uh huh. Sign field mob. Uh-huh. They weren't popping before this. Uh huh. No. So first time you heard field mob, dude. How did you? Oh, Yo, it's 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 the lyrical content. It's the it's the bass, it's the production, it's all of those things in the connection. Like, you know, although we, it's it's pretty indicative of lifestyle for people like us. You know, a lot of the music that's that's being made of that was attracted to me. It was more of, you know, like, wow, I get that. I love that. And I can hear it. Because being a radio promoter, a lot of the music that I hear, I can hear on the radio. And that was probably, or more importantly, what my, my gift is in identifying talent is that I'm also able to promote the talent. Mm-hmm. So is, you know, that's just how it worked for me. And this year, what, what year is did you sign Phil Mob? Oh man, that goes, see, you're trying to date me again. No, nah, I'm, I'm trying to get a timeline you know, of to get the story. A, yo, okay, so that's decades ago. So okay. let me see, Phil Mob was in the 90s. Like like a year, early yeah. mid, mid 90s, right? Yeah. Or no, that was late 90s. Nah, it was it's like Because I think I came down here, yes. Yeah, 97. Came, got you. At this point, 97, mm-hmm. this isn't, I'm going to build a social media following and then you're going to sign me because I have this following, which happens now. Like you have, so this w- is not going to be a talent. So right? now when you find, when you hear, okay, if you want to go, so what you're doing is going to reverse on how you break music is, I guess, the question that you're asking me. Yes. So with Feel Mob, which would be different than modern day mm-hmm. rapper X, singer right. X, et cetera, the radio was the, the the major dynamic on exposing talent. So for an artist such as Feel Mob, the vehicle to expose them would be the mix show, mix show street and clubs. And those were the avenues that you would have to create that momentum from to ultimately get it listened to, position for the radio station to play it, creating momentum. So right? in, that, in that time... We have a mix show. If you can get them on the mix show and people like it, the clubs and... Or variation of thereof. Right. Right, a very de- variation thereof. Like you, you're you going to need the clubs and you're going to need mix show because you're creating an audience. You're mm-hmm. creating fans. You're creating energy, creating excitement, creating value. So you want, you want that. Like you may not hear it on the radio, but when you walk into whatever club you do down here and you hear something, you go, oh, that's cool. And now you can Shazam it, right? Yeah. And go, oh, now I know what it is. Before, you you couldn't. So it's all word of mouth. Mm-hmm. So the mix show guy would tell the PD, yo, this is hot in the club because he's in the club every night and people are asking. Yeah. Or when he plays it, yo, the movement is crazy. Or, you know, the infamous playing, you know, after midnight or the one o'clock hour and no one leaves. Mm-hmm. That's when you know you got something. 
So at this point, like really, you can take a talent. As long as you got talent, the success of this artist isn't 100% up to the artist anymore. It's you have this ability and you got to wrap this artist with someone who can actually get the person on the radio, who can actually get somebody to play their song in the club. And you're creating this product, right? But it's not that way anymore. Or is it just a different, in a different way? Sure it is. It's a team. All you're saying is, is a team. Um, in, in essence, you still need, you need a strong team that you need to establish day one of doing anything. Mm -hmm. Whether you're going into real estate, whether you're going into music, you know, whatever, whatever your appetite for business, going into tech, mm -hmm. you know, Obviously, you need but to. You could be ill on TikTok right now and just get lit. Yeah. So there's always been one hit wonders, though. Like, that hasn't changed. You can go to TikTok and go viral and don't have, never hear from you again, yeah. which is no different than when it was just basic, you know, everybody bought the single and never heard of them again. I feel that. Right? So it's just indicative of the time. You know, different technology just puts you in a different place. Right. But what, we, what we're talking, when I was stating in the beginning about the artist who have transcended, you know, time, space, and periods are real artists. Mm. So there's a difference between having commercial value, right, and, you know, being a, a true artist. Gotcha. Like you can have success and never hear about it again, right? Just one record. For sure. Whatever happened to them. So you hear Phil Mob, you're like, yo, this is really, really dope music. Mm -hmm. And now you get the work, your brain start marketing. How do I take this amazing product and give it to the world? Mm -hmm. What was the big break? Was there a point or something that happened that propelled them to, okay, now they're on? Um, you read the tea leaves. Obviously, um, what's important is back then, credi credibility was getting the home market. Mm -hmm. And if you can't make it in your home market, then it would be very difficult mm -hmm. for you to make it outside. You know, it's difficult if you're a New York rapper and you can't get played in New York people in D.C. don't really care, yeah. right? So, you know, it was, success was regional first. Mm -hmm. And and that was was uh, the way a lot of the determining factors of the tea leaves were being read. Mm -hmm. Now, it's global, right? You can break anywhere. And, and ultimately, you can feed your fans if, you know, if they're on the other side of the world or if they're in Dothan. Gotcha. Right? So now you can see how you're going to maneuver and craft your marketing and planning and how you're going to spend your resources. Gotcha. So you're still, you're in the same space of signing artists mm -hmm. and I guess helping shape their career. Mm -hmm. How have, how has the times changed in your role in terms of what you have to do to assist an artist on kind of get into that superstar status? So I'm um, independent now. I have my own company called Diverse Media, and I have an artist assigned to me from Jackson, Mississippi. Her name is Paris Gatland. Mm -hmm. And what we do is traditionally what a label does. So I'm doing more of everything now in this capacity of than having the support of departments inside of an organized corporate mainstream company. But the functions are still all the same. Yeah. So as you know, in here is you're producing an amazing podcast, but obviously if you were in a, a different environment, you would just walk in, yeah. right? So it's no different. Gotcha. So, and you came from, you started your own label from what label? I uh, started my own label three years ago. And where were you at before then? Uh, Rock Nation Music. So you was at Rock Nation Music. Mm -hmm. How did that opportunity come about? Um, it was the next step from me from Epic. So as I was bringing you through, I went from uh, MCA, left there, went to Def Jam, spent 11, seven years um, there, which we had an amazing run of, of talent that came through. Um, DJ Khaled came through. Uh, Young Jeezy came through. Rick Ross came through. Dang. Rihanna came through. Do Neo Epic? came through. Def Jam. I mean, Def Jam, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. gotcha. Fab Dang. came through. And what'd you do for uh, Def Jam? What was your role? I was the uh, senior vice president of promotions. Senior Vice President Paul. Mm -hmm. So it was on you to promote the... Correct. A radio hits, man. It's a mm. radio hits guy. That's what I did. And then from there I left, we went to uh, Epic and um, got the opportunity to be on the other side of the business with the uh, Executive Vice President role of now getting a true peak on the other side. 
you know, most times we don't get to see how the bones are really curated and, you know, how the business is actually moving. So that was a great opportunity. So executive vice to. president of Rock Nation. Executive vice president of Epic. Of Epic, yes, yes. Correct. Got it, got it, got it. So got that it. helped teed me up um, understanding the business a little better, um, far more than just you know, uh, the surface end of it to really getting into the meat and potatoes. And then that's when the opportunity to go to Rock Nation presented itself. And it was a great opportunity to um, do something i never done before. Uh, we started a distribution um, arm of the company called EQ Distribution. And, you know, it gave artists an opportunity to um, maintain their masters, but um, also get an opportunity to um, stream up into the into the major into the uh, parent company if 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 so be it you know gave gotcha. it, it it worked. How's Jay Z? How is he? In what regards? Like, what is he like? He's a great guy. I mean, <laughs> he's a great guy. Yeah. But... I mean, he's a driven person. Outside of that, I mean, what we all see. I mean, like you, when you go, how is Jay Z? I think Jay Z kind of put it out how he is, right? Like. Success begets more success begets more success on probably somewhere in his life that we don't know there was a spark that he became who he became to be who he is. No, the thing is, I, I think I see, I don't use, I wouldn't see, I, well, I wouldn't use the word driven to describe Jay-Z only from outside looking in. It just seems like his success was more his talent, being able to kind of move through the industry. But, and only because I, I don't see it, right? So but driven, you can't, you, have, you can't have that level. But let's let's just put it, let's park that real quick. You can't have that level of success not being, it's not luck. Yeah, for sure. Right? So then there's a commitment that's being, that you made some point that I'm committed to a vision, a dream, a destination, right? That That goes beyond than just showing up. Like you just can't get to that point yeah. because circumstance. Yeah. That's why, you know, like if we don't know anything about certain people, we can, we would have to make certain assumptions. Yeah. Right. Sure. And that's all I'm saying. Got you. What'd you learn from working in that space of Rock Nation? Um, like, like you don't have to necessarily go big to be big. I mean, it's an independent situation, right? They're probably one of the biggest independent companies in the world, and they're in control of their own destiny. Mm -hmm. And that was inspiring um, for me as well to like, you know what? Y'all, this is what I've been moving towards. This is where I want to go. Gotcha. You being in the, in the music business and executive in the music business, what advice would you have for me? Uh, because we have this new space called podcasting. Mm -hmm. And it's not regulated. There's no... Like right now, you can put some music on Spotify and the artist has to get paid. The person that made the beat gets paid. The person that wrote the lyrics, they get paid from this song mm -hmm. for a four-minute song. And I think you get, what is it, like a million downloads you get like, or a million streams, you get like $5,000, something like that, ballpark. Is that right? Mm -hmm. No? So it's uh, a million streams is the equivalent, let's say, between... Three thousand and four and a half thousand. Yes. Yeah, okay. Like so yeah, between three, four yeah. thousand. So a million streams of a three-minute song will yield you. Let's just say, let's just say thirty-five hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. I do a hour-long podcast, and I have hours and hours and hours of content up. Put it on the same platform, Spotify. Spotify doesn't give me a dime for that. They don't pay you. I was actually about to put my podcast on um, iHeart, and I was, and it was like you gotta, you gotta agree to the terms of service. Terms of service says we are gonna put ads be before your podcast, during your podcast, and after, and we're not obligated to pay you anything. So, I'm like, all right, well, we're in this new space of podcasting where one day that's going to happen. Like it has to be regulated, right? But it's not like music. So from an executive and music perspective, how do you see this whole podcast thing shaping out? Like, well, because I feel like we're early in music when it was, when nobody had it figured out yet. We're just all just doing our thing, right? 
So what advice would you give somebody like me? I want to invite you to pick my brain. Mine too? Mine too. Yours too? Mine too. Yours too. Okay, you guys. We are so excited because we just dropped our newest podcast series called The Brain Picker Podcast. David! Oh, it's going down. You get to pick our brain. You have a business idea, a concept. You're stuck. You can't get off the ground. You need the advice of seasoned, experienced entrepreneurs. Not only entrepreneurs that are practitioners, but we got a lot of people that we've been coaching all over the last decade. All over the globe. They got receipts. Not just that, you never know where your next investor might be hanging out. And the word on the street is, we got all the connections. That's a big fact. We got all the connections. So if you want to sit down with us and pick our brains. In front of our audience. And we're letting you pick our brains. We won't even talk bad about you for doing it in front of our audience, bringing your business maximum exposure. Find the link somewhere around here, wherever you see it. It's there. And apply right now to pick our brain. Let's go. Let's go. Let's get it. Let's get it. <laughs> <laughs> so I would want to take it back and go a little deeper, right? Because you actually posed that question in music about bad deals. Mm-hmm. What's your alternative? Like you could have stayed on Facebook, right? Or um, Facebook, um, YouTube, mm-hmm. where you can monetize. You chose to go on the platform because there's, there's a greater opportunity, yes, right, for you to be global and also the mechanism in the, in the machine that that's going to be behind you for the advertisement aspect of it. And it makes, it puts you in a different place than you could probably put yourself. I feel that. So is it a bad deal? Because ultimately it's what your end goal is. If your end goal now is I'm doing this because you also know the stories of the guys who are making tens of millions of dollars podcasting, right? And part of what you're doing is creating your narrative so that you can now become one of those guys. Mm -hmm. And with that, along the way, you're probably creating brand relationships. I would hope, right? Things that, you know, opportunities that may not readily come to you. But this platform now gives you an opportunity to brand and push yourself. That's how I found you. I wouldn't wouldn't have known you, right? Yeah. Um, uh, is, is because of where you sit now with, with your content. Right. So the recommendation is, would probably definitely be is figuring out, you know, it's always next steps. Yeah. And, you know, how am I going to level up? Right? And how long is it going to take me to level up? And those are all goals. Right. Yeah, like right you, now. You're, you're jumping in, you're in it for a reason, and giving yourself a date. Right. Or at least putting it in. So, you know, it's no different than creating any other business plan. You know, what is what is year one look like? Right. Yeah. What is what is um, three months, um, three years uh, uh, look like? 36 months. Right. Five years, seven years. But not from that level, because I, I do make money from yeah. the pocket. This is not Spotify doesn't pay me. Like mm-hmm. I have to go to a, a, a hosting platform mm-hmm. and a hosting platform. They sell advertisements or whatever. But I do see. That one, like, there's no way that it can continue this way when an artist does the same thing and they get paid. I, I just see, eventually or one day, it will be regulated and people will have to get paid for this content that they're putting on the platform. Just how it is for mm-hmm. music, right? From an executive standpoint, and and I'm, maybe I'm seeing too far in the future. How can I be the person that's responsible? Because that's what ASCAP is, right? Like ASCAP was the company that said, hold on, all these people are putting up all this, this content and these uh, everybody's getting paid but the artists. Everybody gets the benefit. The people get to listen, they're entertained. And I'm thinking, well, maybe there's going to be an ASCAP for podcasting. Am I that guy to create it? It's definitely going to be unification. Yeah. It's, it's some How point. How we do that? We need to set up a company, bro. Yeah, listen, I'm here. That's what I'm here, man. <laughs> After this, we can have that conversation, <laughs> right? Figure out what's next because you're actually um, bringing some points that have my mind just thinking like, wow, yeah, it's, it never stops, right? It's, you know, it's, it's how we, we meaning people are fragmented and if we come together, that's the ability to make change. So your idea and what you're doing now that you're talking it through mm-hmm. and talking into the existence, you have to do that. You have to move forward. You have to become that voice. That's so big. Uh, okay. And uh, <laughs> I mean, like, it, requi- it requires, which I, I, I like this conversation, right? Because I have to be. We can't just be talking no more. 100%. Or keep it to yourself. 
100%. Ultimately, meaning not you per se, but especially people like us, we have the ability and the tendency, you know, we some pontificators. We can talk, we genius. 100%. No action. Drop a, <laughs> right? drop a bar on Instagram. Yo, all like, just up. drop it, B, and be <laughs> gone. Like, yo, what? See you again, here come that same bomb, right? Mm-hmm. But um, but change, change definitely comes with hard work and dedication and commitment and your idea. So I was just being flippant by saying, keep I it to yourself. I don't even know what that first step is. Because I am I think I'm ready to... Uh, maybe, maybe I'm having a conversation because somebody's listening right now and they're saying, I really feel as passionate and maybe Davey got so much going on. And cause, cause it's, go, it's going to happen because I'm seeing a stark difference between people of mm-hmm. music and the podcasting. And like, we're keeping people on the platform way longer. I wonder, I need to talk to somebody who start, whoever started asking. You know who that is? You know no, people? I don't, but I can put you with some folks, so. Put me with some folks. I'll be dope. Mm-hmm. Mission stuff. Okay, all right. So, okay, side note from that. Um, you have a book coming out. Yes, I do. And you were telling me the story. It's a very interesting story. Um, and I'll let you tell the story because I'm like, mm-hmm. dang, I'd have been out of here by then. <laughs> I'll let you tell the story. Okay. So, uh, 20, August 31st, 2014, I was in a near-death car accident. So, leading up to that, I dropped my son off on the 22nd of September to school. Went to... Um, IMG Academy down in Braden, Florida. And then on the 26th, a friend of mine called me and asked me if I wanted to go to a barbecue. Just like most people, get a call, see the name. Said yes. Calls me, that was on a Tuesday. Calls me again on that Thursday, asked me if I was coming. Said yes, I'll be there. That Saturday, I fly from uh, LaGuardia Airport into... Charlotte, North Carolina, get a rental car, drive to um, my sister's house, uh, watch my nephews play football. Later that evening, she and I drove from Charlotte, I mean, I'm sorry, from uh, Columbia to Orangeburg, South Carolina, um, celebrating my father's 70th birthday. So my mother, she has Alzheimer's, spent some time with her. The next day on the 31st, I um, drive from Columbia back to Charlotte, take a flight back home. It's a misty rain happening that day. And at that point, the flight's delayed about an hour and a half. My friend calls me, still delayed. Um, Tell him I'm going to be late. I landed in New York City, had a meeting, made a call home, let him know we were running late. I'm going to be running late and that um, I don't want to put my daughter in the back of the convertible so we would take the truck just because it didn't feel right. Driving out to my friend's house. He calls. He's like, are you still coming? We're just outside. I'm like, yeah, we'll be there. We're almost there. We get to the house, and the really reason why he was so persistent with the call is because he had actually catered um, the barbecue for the two families, and I thought, you know, we were going to a barbecue, so it was really sweet. Four adults, three bottles of wine, we're sitting having conversation, chatting. You know, we peel off to the deck of the house of um, we start uh, catching up on on past events, things that are going on in our lives. And it's, the conversation shifted and got a little heavy and that misty rain happened again. I don't know whether he said or I said, but at some point we said, let's go take a ride. He just purchased a new 550 Benz and we walk from the deck through the kitchen into the carport jump in the car, he backs out, jumps out of the car. He goes, gets a cigar, comes back in. The ladies and the kids, they come out. He pulls out. I don't know why black folks, you know, we always want to see cars go away, right? <laughs> that's what we do, right, as a people. Pulls down the driveway. It's probably the length of a city block in rural New Jersey. Opens the gate, makes a right. Hey, where does man live? Golly, <laughs> opens, goes down a city Open block, gate, opens the gate to get out. Makes a right turn. In the car, I hear a <laughs> car just takes off. So I'd made a call, pick up my phone, and I'm saying to myself, what are you doing? And why are you showboating? We too old for this. So I turn my eyes, 
look at the odometer. Odometer is about 75 miles an hour. Turn my head. He's out cold. <gasps> With his foot on the accelerator. So from where we started at the gate to the impact of the tree, it's a half a mile without a driver. So the first thing I do is what I've been disciplined to do all my life, speak to God. And the first thing I say is, Lord, I guess I'm not going to see my family anymore because I've seen everybody I've walked you through, my entire family. Second thing I go, Lord, I guess I'm going to see you soon because it's very evident at this point that, um, you know, this isn't going to end well. And the third thing, I get angry with God, but I'm glad God didn't get angry with me um, because had I known I was going to die today, I wouldn't have came to the barbecue, right? But I was angry because at this point, I realized who's going to pour wisdom into my son? Who are going to marry my daughters? My wife isn't prepared for this moment. I take care of my mother. Who's going to continue her care? And most importantly, I didn't want to die that day. So we hit trees and bushes and the car accelerates and decelerates. And finally, we hit an obstacle that shoots across the road and we hit a tree, an oak. And at that point, I sustained a level two uh, concussion, L3, L4, vertebrae fracture, mm. bulging disc in my back. We hit the tree so hard that it um, lacerated my liver, which led me to to bleeding half the blood out of my body Dang. and also crushed um, two feet of my small intestine. And at that moment, God put a book inside of me called On Impact. And On Impact, Impact is an acronym for Intuition, Mastery, Pivot, Authenticity, Connections, and Teamwork. And it takes the reader from my journey at 11 years old delivering a newspaper to modern day. And at the end of each chapter is a hit list of takeaways from, from the chapter that the reader can go pretty much, if Benny can do it, I can do it too. Mm -hmm. And that's available on Amazon. <laughs> that's crazy, bro. Yeah. Why did he pass out? What happened? You know, it was um, fatigue, combination of a lot of I different just things. just got out the house? Yeah, man. Followed him through. But you know, I look at it from a different perspective. It's not why did he pass out or what happened? What happened was for the change in my life. We were two people in the same car with different outcomes. So he was only the, he was only the driver for my change. Mm. Did he survive? Oh, yeah. He only had a scratch. Really? Yeah. Scratch. A couple of scratches. I can't, and I, I'm like, I have my, I feel like I'm sitting in the driver's seat where you were. Mm -hmm. And all the stuff that would be going through my mind, this car is going really, really fast. Mm -hmm. No control. Mm -hmm. Do we like try to reach over at the brake or like it's like you're you're just out of control? There, you have you have no control. Zero control. That's a scary place to be. It's a it's a life changing place to be, yeah. right? And you have to heed the call once given to you of what's what you should do and what's next for you, and what you should be doing, right? Because I've been given a second chance at life. So now it's a matter of what do I do with it? Yeah. More than, you know, what's happened prior really had no, no input in, in the moment that I was in. And the moment that I was in gives me the fuel to make what's next best for me. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. That's wild. That's wild. I'm not getting nobody's car. <laughs> from now on like huh yeah if you was drinking I need to see yeah. you open the soda you know what I mean like yeah. I'm not getting nobody's car. that's yeah. crazy yeah. so what, what are some of the takeaways from the book oh man listen so there's um there's a lot of different nuggets that you get mm -hmm. you get the story that I told you on branding um, with my name you learn on how I've done real estate investment for the last 20 years you realize the mistakes that I've made um, being married at 21 years old not that it was a mistake but it was a, a different understanding. Still married to her? No, no. Uh, of the course, she's 21. Not 21. Come on. <laughs> You're 21 nah, and a music nah, industry executive. Nah, like, nah. it's over. But, um, you know, it's all of the things that probably a lot of us have gone through, but, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's in writing. And there's an opportunity for you to go and say, okay, this is how I apply this to my life. Yeah. Or I've been through this. 
okay, this is what I can change in my life. Or, you know what, what's to come for me is if I stay persistent and consistent in my life. So that's what the book's about. I love that, man. Listen, man, go get Benny Pugh's book. Where, where can you find it at? Amazon. Amazon. Just type in Benny Pugh and we'll get that. P-O-U-G-H. P-O-U-G-H. Make sure y'all go get this book. I got to do a quick commercial and then I'm going to uh, come back. You got to close this out with something strong. You got some words of wisdom. I want to hear a story. Okay, get a Man, story. Do we together. just do we just tell a bunch of stories? I need another one. Okay, I need a really really good story. All right, so you got right. to give you a time to like figure that out. This episode is sponsored by the Morning Meetup, themorningmeetup dot com, the only organization that gathers every single day for the committed entrepreneur or someone who wants to get into entrepreneurship. Okay, we are a family. I am, now I'll tell you, I am coaching hundreds of entrepreneurs every single morning. Not via like a pre-recorded video. Literally, we jump on a Zoom call and I get to see how everybody's doing. Y'all was on there this morning, right? Everybody's on there. So literally hundreds of people, like over 500. I think it was almost 600 people there this morning. And it is a community. So every now and again throughout the year, we get together. And it's just, I just put on a conference and they don't got to pay nothing to be a part of it. They just get to come and we get to commune and just have a relationship. We have a book club where we're, we're reading a book every single month but we only read about a chapter, no more than 10 pages together. We'll read it the night before or the morning before the call, and then we'll discuss what we learned. And that is a conversation that we have every single morning, Monday through Friday. So go to themorningmeetup.com. This episode would have been sponsored by Recession Proof. I'm just waiting for it. You know what I mean? Waiting for my boy M500. You know what I mean? Come through. You know what I mean? You, go, you need to sponsor. You know what I mean? Like, just sponsor our episode, man. But yes, Recession Proof. You, you're in a Recession Proof? Yeah, he's the GOAT. He's the GOAT. You got him. I'm, you know, I'm enjoying recession proof so I can get a plane. <laughs> you got a plane. Oh. Normally, you know what? It used to be back in the day, you see like people at planes are music industry people or they don't own the plane. They just get on a private jet. That was my first experience of like a jet, like a rapper or a musician. Mm-hmm. That guy's something special. All right, cool. So thank you so much for coming, man. Appreciate I it. I really appreciate you, man. So oh, I, got, I got this one question I want to ask real quick. Um, where do you see yourself in five years or what is a major goal that you want to accomplish within the, in, within five years so that I can listen to this episode later and say, yo, I have Benny Pugh on the podcast. He said he was going to do that five years ago. Look, he did it. What'd so first and foremost, I will truly be a better person mm. so that you don't know me. You'll only, you'll be able to see my work starting from you being connected me to me today, seeing how my works actually start to expand based on driving through my book, um, establishing a real footprint with my business, and also continuing to mentor and teach the people that are around me. Um, more importantly, um, the next five years, uh, I definitely want to um, do a lot of the things that I never had a chance to do when I was fully corporate, enjoy myself. Mm. Right. I want to live a good quality life because being in a near death situation, realizing if that was last my last day, my life was committed and just to help business. Yeah. You know, when you look at uh, work life balance, it was all work 80, 20. Mm. Right. So on a private note for me is you'll see a lot of smile and cheese. Right. Like, <laughs> yeah. yo, he happy and he's happy regardless, mm. regardless if, you know, the 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 uh, the bands are big or the bands are even, or you know what? The bands aren't the same. So more importantly is um, living in my purpose. I love it. I love it. Well, look, man, I I want to say thank you for uh, for coming by. This is You flew down to New York just for this. Not, Come not on, man. Modern. Who do uh, I bill? Huh? <laughs> oh. <laughs> what? Bill <No>, Marcus. <laughs> Marcus. You... No, thank you, sir. Uh, no Appreciate problem. it. No, thank you so much. So, um, uh, again, um, make sure you guys follow Benny Pugh. What, how do you spell it on Instagram? P-O-U-G-H. Okay. And it's just Benny Pugh. B-E-N-N-Y P-O-U-G-H on yeah. all my handles. Uh, well, do, do us a favor, man. Close us out with a story. You have a great story. Wow, oh, this is a story. Okay. So, you know what's really interesting? This is a real estate story. So during my journey, uh, while I was in the music business, I realized that there weren't a lot of salt and pepper hair black men um, moving around the business. So I decided at a point that I would start purchasing real estate. So uh, uh, my first piece of property was in Inglewood, New Jersey. I grew that, started purchasing in different locations nearby. 
currently I own in uh, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, um, Florida, South Carolina, uh, uh, probably like 100 doors at this point. So when I was um, really active and heavy in, in the Hartford, Hartford, Connecticut area, I was buying a city block, right? So it was a building that extended from one end to the next. It was on Park Avenue, um, Park Street, um, and Lawrence, right, was, was the connection point. So I purchased the, the building through my LLC, so they never had no identity of who I was. Um, and it was really interesting because this was, it was a very, very, very unique buy. And it was one of those, um, buildings that everyone wouldn't get access to or opportunity to. It was in a Spanish, um, neighborhood. And obviously, as we were talking earlier, um, you know, communities staying together. So this building had, might have been transacted and sold three other times prior and it was always to somebody of uh, Latin descent. Mm. And it was crazy. Um, once we go in through the process, you know, we do all the, all the due diligence. No one had ever met me. Finally, we get to close, closing all the materials. They never met me because I did, you know, doing all of this. I knew what it was, but never showed up. So at some point, they asked for my license. And then my license they realized I was black. Mm -hmm. And when they found out I was black, they got mad. Really? Like how, yo, we felt like they got hoodwinked because that was an asset of value that now was changing ownership outside of the community. Mm -hmm. And the community is the people who move the money from one person, one organization, to another so that they keep the money moving around. Mm -hmm. They cursed my lawyer out. They got mad. It's crazy, B. It was a valuable asset though. You know, so found out to be quite, quite amazing that, you know, uh, it just shows you that it doesn't matter how much money you have. It's about your connection and how much power you have. Right. So it's a combination of the two and also being re resourceful to figure out where the best opportunities are. Yeah. But, um, you know, I found that to be really comical at the time. You still got it? Yo, beast. Nah, it burned down. It burned I mean, down? I, I didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> no insurance plays on this, on yeah, this podcast? Yeah, I ain't do it. Yeah, yeah, right? Yo, 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 D no. Right. Yeah, I had nothing to do with that. <laughs> well, Betty, I appreciate you, all man. Right. Close us out with a word of wisdom, man, for all the young entrepreneurs out there that's looking to make a mark in the world. Yo, if you see it, if you believe it, you see it, then do it. It's, it's just that easy. You know, it, it's, it's not an easy journey, but it's a well worthwhile payoff. There we have it. Listen, we can't close it out no better than that. Do yourself a favor. Go follow Benny Pugh. Do yourself another favor. Okay, join the morning meetup. And also, please, 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 go build something big. Go build something big. Get you some social proof that you can start from wherever you are to build something amazing. But the key is to go back to your community and teach someone else how you did it. All right, we are out of here. Peace.